So I'm speaking with Oriana Mastro, who's a fellow at the Asia, uh, Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center, part of the Freeman Spogli Institute here at Stanford. Uh, she is a scholar uh, who has studied the Chinese military, but she's also a reserve officer in the U.S. Air Force, uh, an intelligence officer who has briefed uh, some very senior commanders about uh, Chinese military policy, and in particular, what everybody has been worried about since the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, the threat uh, that China poses to Taiwan. And so, uh, Oriana, you're on record as saying that this is something we really ought to be worrying about. Why don't you, why don't you explain, you know, why you think that? Well, first, let me say, of course, thank you for having me, and that the views I am about to express are my own and do of not course. represent those of the United States government, Department of Defense, or the United States Air Force. So it's funny when you say that this has now become an issue since the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, a former Joint Chiefs in a meeting I was in recently said, oh, this Taiwan issue just became a problem like two years ago. You know, this is all I've been doing my adult life. You know, to me, this has been an issue for quite some time. But it is true there's a new sense of urgency. Something has changed. And so there are a number of things that have changed. The first and foremost is Chinese military capacity. I have this discussion with a lot of my colleagues, especially senior colleagues in the China field, who would say we were just better at diplomacy before than we are now. Listen, the Chinese military used to not be able to fly over water. It's not surprising to me that there wasn't a huge threat. Most people don't realize in the 1990s, like the military of Taiwan was stronger than the military of the PRC. So a big part of it is uh, some changes that happened in their force posture, which we can discuss more. Um, and, and then Xi Jinping himself, who has made a significant number of statements suggesting that he wants to s that the status quo is not good enough anymore. So Taiwan has always been an important issue for China. And, you know, on the U.S. side and maybe in other countries, people can be like, oh, you know, who cares? Like, why can't China just care about prosperity? Why do they care about Taiwan or even some other territorial disputes? But the bottom line is a big part of Communist Party legitimacy is about territorial integrity and also standing up to foreign aggression. And Taiwan kind of falls very squarely in both of those camps in that, the civil war that ended with the communists winning and establishing the People's Republic of China is not actually over yet because their opponent, the nationalists, fled to the island of Taiwan. So they haven't sort of fully won until Taiwan is, you know, de facto and de jure under Communist Party control. And it's also about foreign aggression because there was a period of time in which the Japanese had occupied that mm -hmm. island as well. Sure. And it's very important for the party to regain all territories in their view that were taken by greed um, and aggression by other countries. Right. Okay, so Oriana, um, the thing that's frustrated me about a lot of this discussion mm -hmm. is that people are talking about the possibility of a major military operation without actually being at all specific about what it would look like, the forces that would be involved, and what the relative uh, capabilities would be. And mm -hmm. you're kind of uniquely positioned to understand mm -hmm. all of that. Um, what scenario, mm -hmm. concrete military scenario, that the Chinese could execute in the next, you know, in the coming years worries you the most? So let me see, there's a number of scenarios that the Chinese military prepares for. Four main ones. Mm -hmm. They have something called the Joint Missile Campaign, which is basically they shoot a lot of missiles at Taiwan, and ideally Taiwan capitulates and, and it's over quickly. Uh, they have a blockade, and there can be various levels of that, from like something administrative, like you just go and say I have to inspect these ships before they go, so it's mm -hmm. costly, uh, to a full blockade in which nothing comes in and out. Uh, you have what is referred to as a counter-intervention campaign, which is basically China targeting U.S. Uh, bases in preemptively. particular. Uh, preemptively or obviously during the war, uh, mm -hmm. during any conflict as well, that mm -hmm. would definitely be on the table. And then the last one, which is I'm most concerned about, which is the amphibious assault, which is basically putting, you know, tens of thousands of, t you know, hundreds of thousands of Chinese troops on ships making their way across the strait. Mm -hmm. Now, most China specialists think the first three, China can do without a problem. Like, operationally, there's very little debate. They have the most advanced cruise and ballistic missile program in the world, more advanced than the United States. The debate is about the last one. Now, the reason I'm concerned about the last one is, to me, that's the only reunification campaign. Blockade, missiles, like, all of that is extremely risky because it gives the United States time to come to Taiwan's aid. 
Right now, the only war that China's confident it could win is if it takes Taiwan quickly before it has to face the full force of the mm -hmm. U.S. military. Mm -hmm. And I just don't see the people of Taiwan sort of capitulating under coercion. So people are like, well, you know, won't China prefer a cyber attack? I just don't see how, you know, cyber can't hold territory, how that would actually lead to Taiwan being fully a part of, of the PRC. Um, so the amphibious assault... Basically speaking, you need all elements of power, naval, air, ground. You're putting people onto ships. They're making their way across the strait, and they have to be protected. So you have to have air superiority, and that is in the form of, of aircraft, but also potentially attacking U.S. air bases. And I say bases, but really the United States only has one um, in combat radius of Taiwan, mm -hmm. that's in Kadena. Um, that's on the island of Okinawa. Right, uh, in Japan. Uh so that the Chinese would have air superiority pr to protect their fleet. Probably first they would flush out their submarines also as a protection mechanism. So the, the ships themselves would be making their way across, in my view, before the missiles start raining on Taiwan mm -hmm. to get rid of Taiwan's own defenses. So this is actually, you know, it, it, it is possible that Xi Jinping doesn't make the call, like it's go time, until there are already ships at sea making their way across. He can kind of take a look around, be like, how are other countries, you know, are there submarines here that we didn't know were here or something like that, mm -hmm. and then make the final call. So at that point, they attack all the defenses, air bases, ports uh, in, in Taiwan uh, with uh, aircraft, but mostly with uh, missiles. And then they sail their way across, they mm -hmm. land, uh, they surround Taipei, and yeah. they hope that the leadership just capitulates and there's minimal casualties. And I've seen Chinese writings that say that they could do it, you know, in 100 hours. So that's probably too optimistic, but definitely, you know, mm -hmm. in two to three weeks. Uh, just as a matter of curiosity, how do you know that there are these four potential scenarios that the Chinese themselves are thinking about? So the ch so there's a few ways that I go about my research. So this one is a little uh, less mysterious because the Chinese have um, sort of authoritative military uh, training modules in which they write that these are the four campaigns that mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. preparing for. So this took and a they write about this openly. Right. So this took a little bit less detective work maybe mm -hmm. than some of the other stuff that I do. But for the most part, I try to take a look at what the Chinese are saying and writing, uh, what they're building. And then what activities the um, and behaviors that they're encompassing, right? Because it's not always the case that those things come together. But if what they're saying is what they're building, is what they're doing, then I have a higher confidence level mm -hmm. that that's what they're preparing for. Mm -hmm. So they openly also discuss of the, the problems, right? Their weaknesses, where they need to improve when it comes to the amphibious assault. So... On one hand, people say, well, maybe this is false confidence. Now they're saying we might be able to do it. And I would argue, you know, for 15 years, they said they couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And they listed all the reasons why and all the progress they were making. Mm -hmm. So it's not the case that they, they sort of just make things up. Um, it's also the assessment of many in the U.S. government that they might be able to do it. And so it's not shocking to think maybe those in China have the same viewpoints. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, lastly, in terms of how quickly this can happen. The Chinese, uh, you know, take into account how long it takes for the United States to mobilize. And we might think, and some Western observers say, listen, the Chinese don't have enough ships for this. Or, man, once they get on that island of Taiwan, though, they're going to be fighting a, an insurgency that's going to last decades. Whether or not that's true, I have never read or heard anything from the Chinese side mm -hmm. saying that they feel like they don't have enough ships. And they have the largest shipbuilding industry in the world. I'm confident that if they thought they needed more ships, they mm -hmm. would build more mm -hmm. ships. And I've never heard them write about concerns about suppressing the population of Taiwan. So when it comes to deterrence, you know, for it to impact Chinese decision making, they have to think that way. It's not enough for some scholar over in the United States to say, well, you know, I wouldn't do it under these conditions, or I would want more ships, or I would want a larger you know, troop to invasion mm -hmm. ratio. Mm -hmm. If the Chinese feel confident, I think that's where the danger lies, that they right. might actually do it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the geopolitics of mm -hmm. these scenarios. Your fourth scenario, which is just the amphibious grab, mm -hmm. uh, presumably there's a version of it where they don't have to attack any American mm -hmm. forces in the theater. Mm -hmm. So it's a purely China-Taiwan conflict, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore we don't have any immediate reason our people haven't been targeted and killed mm -hmm. and so that reduces the 
prospect that we would get involved. Um, now, we were just in Japan together. We had a lot of interesting talks with a whole variety of Japanese uh, foreign policy and security officials. And, um, uh, you know, their role in this is also very critical. So I guess there's a couple of questions, you know. The one that we probably simply cannot answer at this point is whether the United States itself would come to Taiwan's defense. I mean, we can plan for it. We can try to, you know, deter this Chinese attack. Mm -hmm. But whether the American people would actually want their sons and daughters to, you know, go into what would potentially be a very big war, that's, I think, we'd have to say is an open question. Uh, but what other elements, you know, have to be in place for a real deterrence strategy to work? I mean, certainly the threat that we would enter such a conflict has to be there. And I think President Biden has said that. Maybe his advisors didn't like it so much, but, you know, he said that pretty clearly. But what other things, particularly with respect to Japan, needs to, needs to happen? So the problem with the threat of U.S. military intervention is, you know, that used to be enough. It used to be that regardless of the scenario, if the United States was going to be directly involved, China could not win. And that's why it was successful at imposing caution on the Chinese. Given their improvements in military capabilities, and given how long it takes the United States to bring significant firepower into the region, the question is not so much in the Chinese mindset now about whether the United States will defend Taiwan, which I'll, I'll get to your question about U.S. public resolve there in a second, but whether or not we can. Mm -hmm. right? The United States could have all the resolve in the world, and if China is able to establish this fait accompli before we have significant military forces to respond, well, operationally, of course, you could say the United States can still attack China. Politically, that seems very difficult to mm -hmm. me, right, that a U.S. president would then attack China, especially if China hasn't directly attacked the United States. Mm -hmm. There's minimal casualties and the war is over, mm -hmm. right? So on the resolve issue... So it would be, the burden would be on us to then escalate after a right. Chinese fait accompli. Right, and that yeah. no fighting is currently happening. Mm -hmm. right? So this is one of the things that, you know, why I try to bring the operational picture with that strategic and political picture. Because sometimes you might say, well, operationally, we can do A, B, and C, and the military does this all the time. But then I take a look at that, and I'm like, no president's going to do this, mm -hmm. right? So you have to have feasible options. So we treat resolve like it's this, like, either you have it or you don't. But to give you an extreme scenario, if you go to the American people or to a U.S. leader and you said, okay, we're going to defend Taiwan, and we will 100% win, and no Americans are going to die, mm -hmm. right? Their response would be very different than like, we may or may not win, here are the costs, right? So how the war would unfold, and that is based on how prepared we are, can influence the degree to which we're willing to fight it. Mm -hmm. And so in a lot of my work, what I'm trying to do is create scenarios in which uh, U.S. leadership has options that are acceptable at an acceptable cost level for them such that, of course, they will defend Taiwan. And more importantly, when you talk about Japan, that we can deny China the ability of landing long enough for us to get there. So a big component of that is building up Taiwan's defenses, right? So they can hold off China. And in my mind, this is where Japan is critical. It's the first couple of days of the war. Now, in our discussions, you know, Japanese leadership might say, we will be supportive, but kind of later on, you know, the United States intervenes and then maybe we'll consider supporting in, in a number of ways. I would honestly prefer to have the Japanese military 100% in for the first 14 days and then do nothing after that than wait uh, until we get involved. And that's largely because Japan is much closer with um, many more forces than we have, like in theater, so that they could play a really critical role in staving off the invasion long enough for the United States to come in. And Kadena Air Force Base is really critical to all of this, right? Because this is where American land-based aircraft would stage out of. Um, I assume we probably wouldn't have aircraft carriers right in the theater just because of the threat to right. the carriers themselves. So the land-based air is mm -hmm. very important. I think to uh, people who don't follow this maybe as closely as I do, the questions I get a lot is, is this sort of surprise of like, well, what do you mean China can do this and the United States can't respond very quickly? One is the United States is not a resident power in Asia, right? We rely on allies and partners to host us. And the geography is Asia, of Asia is such that 
I mean, like the South China Sea, it's, it's, it's a big ocean, yeah. right? Yeah. And so even projecting power from like Guam, you know, if you say, okay, our submarines have to go to Guam, um, you know, to replenish or reload, like that takes weeks of transit time there and back. And the farther you're projecting power, the more you're relying on things called enablers. So mm -hmm. like as an aircraft, you need a tanker to refuel you or you need space assets to help you navigate and things like that. When you're closer to home, you have more redundancy. You can you know, rely on a walkie-talkie and you can rely on you know, fiber optic cables and you can rely on satellites. That's what the Chinese have at their disposal. And so really, you know, even the Australians who are great, you know, they fully support U.S. efforts. They are really far away in mm -hmm. terms of making a significant difference, and their military is quite small. Uh, the recent agreement between the United States and the Philippines is potentially a game changer because the northern Philippines, beyond Okinawa, is kind of the most closest access point um, mm -hmm. for the United States. South Korea doesn't, you know, wants does not want to play a role, and not even not play a role, they will not agree to let U.S. use its assets in South Korea to support this. I had a, a piece in the Washington Quarterly recently about this, arguing for how we can try to get more South Korean support. And until recently, the Japanese have also been like, we're not going to play any role in this mm -hmm. conflict. Mm -hmm. Now, in our trip, the, you know, what we learned is there have been improvements, right? The Japanese are building up their own capabilities. They might be willing to provide a supporting function to the United States. If Kadena is attacked, we talked to many that said the Japanese would be more involved and would consider that an attack on Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I wrote in this Washington Post op-ed, the Japanese involvement does not extend to defending Taiwan. Mm -hmm. That seems like a minor point. But, you know, as you know, meeting after meeting, I would ask, you know, yes, I get it. If missiles are coming towards Japan or ships are heading towards Japan, you will fight them. But what if they're only going towards Taiwan? And then it was sort of like, well, that's not really a threat to Japan. That's mm -hmm. none of our business. So, mm -hmm. so I think, you know, the United States just needs more access points. Um, and even then we have problems with, like, not having enough munitions, mm -hmm. even if we did get there. So this is actually a pretty basic problem. We need a, you know, a lot of mass, a lot of firepower in the Taiwan Strait, yeah. and it's just really difficult to get it there. Yeah, the timing seems to be critical. I mean, one people have complained that so much ammunition has been used up by the Ukrainians that we actually have run down our stocks if there's a near-term Taiwan contingency. Uh, but if the contingency is still a few years off, it may be a spur to our defense industrial base, you know, to actually get serious about, you know, producing more stuff. But that's a, that's a kind of a separate question. Um, let's just talk about Xi Jinping himself. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is an area I, you know, imagine you don't have particular, you're mm -hmm. not a great pal of his, he doesn't right. confide in you. Uh, I guess the one thing that makes me skeptical about the likelihood of a Taiwan invasion uh, is really just a political calculation on his part. I mean, the military may be ready to go whenever he says, mm -hmm. uh, but it strikes me that he's actually quite different from Putin. Putin has mm -hmm. been a big risk taker. Mm -hmm. I wrote my PhD dissertation actually on Soviet threats to intervene in the Middle East, and basically I said they, they were always bluffing. You know, they, they threatened after the crisis had really passed so that they get some credit, but they didn't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. Putin puts troops in Syria, he puts troops in Venezuela, he puts troops, you know, all over the place. Uh, and then he takes Crimea in 2014, and then he invades uh, uh, Ukraine. And I don't really see anything of a comparable risk-taking scale. And in fact, she seems to me to have been fairly cautious in his career. And so is there anything that makes you think, I mean, Look, you, you, your military can come to you and say, okay, we can get this done. You know, we'll go quickly. The Americans, you know, will then be faced with uh, this fait accompli. But he's got to realize that that's, a, that's like the biggest, you know, mm -hmm. world historical gamble ever. And given the potential mm -hmm. consequences of an actual war between the United States and China, do you think he's really, you know, prepared to do that? So first and foremost, I completely, like, agree with your assessment. Xi Jinping is not Vladimir Putin. You know, I get this a lot of, like, he's an autocrat and, you know, he, he just cares about himself and his future, gamble for resurrection type mm -hmm. of thing. The saddest thing, if this war actually happens, is how easily deterrable it was. Like, if 
If the United States, its allies and partners, just made what I consider relatively minor changes in force posture, like we talked about, just like building up some more munitions and having them closer, I think then Xi Jinping would say, okay, if I'm not certain I can do this, I'm not going to do it. The problem in my mind is we actually haven't made, until recently, like this agreement with the Philippines, um, movement on AUKUS, you know, We've been talking that's about the Asia. Uh, that's the, the, the deal with the Australians Australia, to give them some submarine UK, technology. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, we've been moving so slowly and doing mm-hmm. so little. So, mm-hmm. you know, part of you know my hysteria about this <laughs> is trying to get that sense of urgency because we are getting to the point where we're running out of time on the clock. Now, the important thing to note when you say, "Oh, the military goes to Xi Jinping and says we can do this." I think it's important to note that Xi Jinping asked the military to be able to do this. So it wasn't that the military was like, okay, you know, as part of the normal modernization process, this is going to be our priority, and then we'll go to Xi Jinping. He's like, oh, this is interesting that now you can do this. Mm -hmm. Xi Jinping has said to the military, like, I want you to have the capability Mm -hmm. to take Taiwan by Mm -hmm. force. Uh, Coupled with the fact that his main program of national rejuvenation, he says it cannot be completed until... Taiwan, you know, Mm -hmm. is 100%. This leads to some speculation that this is something, the benefits of which are are just so immense for Xi, he might might be able to do it. Now, I also agree he's pragmatic. So, you know, how we see the costs and benefits determines whether or not we think he's risk acceptant or risk averse. Mm -hmm. But in some cases, you know, in government documents, one of my favorite things when they say, oh, Xi Jinping might miscalculate and take Taiwan by force, I sort of circle that. I say, it might not be a miscalculation. It might just be a calculation, Mm -hmm. right? If what I'm laying out as as a potential scenario is correct, that they take Taiwan very quickly with minimal casualties, you know, they reassert themselves in the region, Xi Jinping is, you know, going to be hailed forever because unlike, you know, Putin and Russia, the Chinese people are really excited about the prospect of this reunification. Then you have all these benefits, a weakened U.S. position, potentially fragmenting of allies. Mm-hmm. Like, this is their future to being the hegemon of Asia. Then, you know, maybe it's not so risky. So, in a lot of articles that say China would never do this, I love to tell people, like, look at the conditions they lay out. In the beginning, it's like, if the whole world stopped trading with China after they invaded Taiwan, they won't do this. Yeah, I agree. But, like, the Europeans are currently making pilgrimages to China in spite of, the you know, how difficult they're being both in Asia and with their support to Russia. Does it really look like the European partners are going to stop trading with them? Mm-hmm. Does it really look like Southeast Asian countries yeah. are going to stop trading with them? I just don't see it yet. Yeah. Well, uh, so, lest we be accused of being warmongers, mm-hmm. I think it's probably important that we should point out just how, how horrendous a general war between mm-hmm. the U.S. and China will be. <laughs> you may not even want to get it. Well, I mean, you would not want to get into a general war, mm-hmm. but I think the scenario does raise a lot of escalatory uh, possibilities uh, where you can't rule that kind of war out. And compared to everything that's happened in Ukraine, we're now at the mm-hmm. first year anniversary of the Russian invasion. It seems to me a China-U.S. conflict is going to be so much bigger. It's going to have such a much bigger uh, impact except in this one scenario where, you know, China makes this quick grab and in 48 hours Mm -hmm. it's got Taiwan and then Mm -hmm. everybody backs down, you know, Mm -hmm. which strikes me as not terribly, you know, not terribly likely. And I think it's important to emphasize to all you viewers out there Mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, we're not interested in seeing this war happen. I mean... I mean, that's the whole point of deterrence. Yes. You know, people might say to me, like, oh, you know, you're being so... Uh, belligerent about this, but the bottom line is, unless we establish deterrence, mm-hmm. that's what makes this war more likely, yeah. right? When you talk about general war, it's not only the fact that like the United States and China fighting a protracted war means like, you know, no trade in Asia, the most dynamic, important economic region in the world during the course of the war itself. Then probably, you know, one of the saddest things I think about is I can't envision a world in which China and the United States have a relationship with each with each other after the Mm -hmm. war. Mm -hmm. It's unlikely, given our militaries, that one side would dominate the other and then impose some sort of settlement, right? We would probably fight for years to some stalemate and then negotiate some settlement. But all this is to say that, you know, when countries 
or entities, even Taiwan, that's like, oh, well, it's not popular with our people to raise taxes for this, that, and the other. You know, I always say, like, deterrence is expensive. War is even more expensive, yeah. right? And so it's really that desire to take that off the table for the Chinese. Mm-hmm. You know, to not make it tempting at all because they're like, this is an impossibility. It's not something we can do. You know, add on some reassurance that the United States is not seeking the independence of Taiwan. And then, you know, we can maintain the status quo forever. Right. But it does require that the United States adjust and allies and partners adjust their defense postures to deal with the evolving threat that is the Chinese military. Yeah. And I think it's important, again, on the anniversary of the uh, Russian invasion to realize that there is a huge deterrence failure in Ukraine. Right. You know, in 2014, the Russians grabbed uh, uh, the Crimean Peninsula. They entered the Donbass. They began an eight-year mm-hmm. low-level war. Uh, basically, uh, the United States still continued to refuse to arm Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Uh, it didn't impose very heavy sanctions mm-hmm. on Russia. Mm-hmm. And in 2022, you had a full-scale invasion. And so that mm-hmm. was a clear failure of deterrence. Uh, and so we don't want something like that to happen uh, in the case of Taiwan. Right. And a lot of the actors, if I can add on to my frustrations, mm-hmm. a lot of countries, government officials I talk to say, oh, Oriana, don't worry. Once the war actually starts, then all, then all these things will fall into place, right? Mm-hmm. The United States defense industrial complex will mm-hmm. come to life and the Japanese, uh, you know, will throw off their constitutional limitations and fight alongside of us. NATO, the Europeans all of a sudden will have an appetite for direct involvement in conflict, stop trading completely, whatever it is. But in my view, like, that's already too late. Now we're fighting this general war Mm -hmm. that's of such a level of brutality. Like, wouldn't it have been better if we had made certain statements, agreements, declarations beforehand to prevent this? So it's interesting to me that a lot of governments will say, oh, we don't want to upset China. So we're not going to make any moves now. But, like, don't worry if, you know, once the war actually happens and we're fully on your side. You know, I get that, that they want positive relationships with China, but at least in my mind, the number one priority is preventing this war from happening. Absolutely. And, and I'm willing to uh, absorb the costs, whether they be economic, political, or what have you, to ensure that it never happens. Yeah, well, we can definitely agree that uh, that would be a horrible uh, eventuality, and we really need to do everything we can to prevent it. Okay, Ariana, thank you very much for talking to me. That's mm-hmm. Very informative and, uh, you know, keep up the good work. Thank you for having me.